If you haven't been living under a rock for the past couple of years, then you probably heard about a fashion trend called Gorbcore. Well, living under a rock is actually quite a Gorbcore thing to do, so you've probably still heard of it. The term was coined by Jason Chen in a 2017 article for The Cut, with the word Gorp being an acronym for the phrase good old raisins and peanuts and basically just means trail mix. This is a reference to the lifestyle of hikers or anyone who spends a lot of time in nature. Trail mix is a classic snack utilised by these sorts of people because it is light to carry yet nutritious and calorific. I've heard people online claim that Gorpcore specifically stems from Portland, Oregon due to the weather and hiking culture there. However, I think anyone who's lived in the place with consistently shitty weather can attest to the presence of people wearing Gorpy clothes before it was cool. And you can quite easily guess I am one of those people judging by my beautiful accent. Regardless, I'm not here to debate which city pioneered the style. The one thing we can say for certain is celebrities help catalyze the style's rise to the forefront of modern streetwear. As per usual, ASAP Rocky was an early adopter, but I think the most notorious example was Frank Ocean Ooh, wearing a mammoth jacket and an Arcteryx beanie to a Louis Vuitton fashion show in early 2019. This was the point where the mainstream got its first taste of incorporating these sorts of garments into everyday fashion beyond just necessity. Not long after, we had the COVID pandemic, and in a weird way I think this pushed the trend to new heights. With lockdowns and social distancing being enforced everywhere, many people turned to nature walks or hikes to maintain both their physical and mental health. And when they weren't doing this, they had their eyes glued to apps such as TikTok and were constantly being fed this viral meme that undeniably had a part to play in the popularity of Gorpcore. At the centre of this meme was the Arcteryx shell jacket which very quickly became a staple of the trend and the IT item that everyone wanted. Although other outerwear options such as puffer jackets or fleeces were very sought after within the trend, none of them would come close to the insane levels of popularity that these shell jackets received. The driving force behind this was their functionality. They were both completely waterproof and breathable which allowed you to go viral on TikTok for taking a shower. Arcteryx is not responsible for the technology behind this. Gore-Tex is a textile with 9 billion pores per square inch that are 20 times smaller than a water droplet, allowing air particles to pass through but not water. This material is manufactured by WL, Gore and Associates who have partnerships with over 300 consumer brands. You may be thinking, if the material is available to so many brands, then how did Arcteryx become the de facto Gorb Gore-Tex jacket? I think this happened due to all the other competitor brands already being associated with different groups of people in modern fashion. Patagonia was seen as the uniform for tech bros in Silicon Valley, while North Face, for example, was extremely popular with row men in the UK during the 2010s. Arcteryx had only previously been appreciated by a niche audience of actual hikers, alpinists and other athletes. It was something new for the streetwear enjoyers to fixate on, plus it had a cool bird skeleton logo. I think it's fair to say that Gore-Tex is synonymous with Gorbcore. It's what everyone wants as a badge of honour on the sleeve of their jacket. Some people even think the word Gorp comes from Gore-Tex, which is understandable considering how similar they sound. Although the material has only gained massive global recognition in recent years, it was actually invented back in the late 60s. Wilbur L. and Genevieve Gore launched the brand from their family home in Newark, Delaware. Wilbert left his job at DuPont to pursue this venture as he was a firm believer that the polymer polytetrafluoroethylene had an immense amount of untapped potential. This material is more commonly known as PTFE or even more commonly known as Teflon. You know, the stuff that made nonstick pans work but turned out to be potentially toxic to humans. Ooh, that's a little bit of foreshadowing for you, but we'll get to that later. In 1969, Wilbert's son, Bob, discovered that if you rapidly stretch PTFE under certain conditions, you can create an incredibly strong and microporous material that has low water absorption and good weatherproofing properties. This was subsequently named EPTFE, or Expanded Polymer Polytetrafluoroethylene, and then used to create the product Gore-Tex. Gore went on to make a multitude of different products and technologies and ultimately became extremely successful and an absolute titan in the textile industry. During the mid-2010s, the environmental pressure group Greenpeace started campaigning against the use of hazardous chemicals in the fashion industry. The Detox My Fashion campaign had a large focus on per and polyfluoroalkyls, or PFAs for short. A quick note, this group of chemicals were previously referred to as perfluorochemicals or PFCs, so if you go on to do your own research on this subject, which I encourage you do, then just be aware that these two names are generally referring to the same thing. PFAs do not break down in the environment and have been detected in ecosystems across the globe including some of the most remote regions of the planet. These chemicals are known to be carcinogenic and have hormonal effects. So, how does this all tie in with Gore-Tex? Well, EPTFE, aka the Gore-Tex membrane, requires the use of PFAs as an auxiliary agent during the material's production. Additionally, the coating that is applied to the fabric requires PFAs to function as well as it does. 
This coating is called Durable Water Repellent or DRW and is responsible for the water repellent properties of Gore-Tex including the beading which was the feature of Arc'teryx jackets that completely captivated the fashion community during the rise of gore -core. The Greenpeace campaign shed light on the fact that the outdoor clothing industry was one of the worst environmental offenders when it came to using PFAs. These products were designed to enable consumers to spend time in natural environments, yet they also played an active role in damaging them. Unsurprisingly, lots of hikers, runners, campers, climbers and skiers were very happy to support this campaign, which put pressure on a lot of brands. The first companies to sign PFA-free commitments were Paramo, Rotorf and Vord. Not long after, over 150 activities were organised globally by people in the outdoor community to demand that other companies such as the North Face, Mammoth and Hagloffs follow suit. Subsequently, many of these brands pressured Gore to eliminate their use of hazardous PFAs as they were the industry leader in supplying waterproof membranes to the outdoor industry. In 2017, the Gore Fabrics division finally announced it would commit to phasing out PFAs of environmental concern from its general outdoor weatherproofing laminates by the end of 2020 and from its specialised weatherproofing laminates by the end of 2023. Now, before you applaud Gore for making this pledge, you should know that they not only missed the 2020 deadline but they also pushed it back half a decade to 2025 due to issues with product development and scaling challenges. I really hope that those scaling challenges weren't Gore Fabrics prioritizing meeting the massive rise in demand for Gore-Tex jackets by the mainstream fashion market in the past three to five years. And before all the Gore-Tex lawyers come for me, I am not accusing the company of doing this. I am just pointing out that the timelines for both the Gore PFC commitment and the rise in the Gore Core trend line up very well in parallel with each other. Without a clear explanation from Gore Fabrics on what these scaling challenges actually mean, consumers like us can only speculate with the information we do have. To the company's credit, in 2022 they released a new completely PFA-free version of Gore-Tex that replaces the main EPTFE membrane with one made of expanded polyethylene or EPE which has a better strength to weight ratio than its counterpart. This not only means the fabric can be lighter and thinner but also contributes to it having a lower carbon footprint. However, this will not completely replace good old PFA infused Gore-Tex as stated by this small print text on this EPE graphic by Gore Fabrics. It is just an option for consumers for the time being, and I have to say, there seems to only be a very small number of products currently available featuring EPE Gore-Tex. This combined with the fact that around 50% of Gore fabrics still have PFAs in the DRW coating makes the company's sustainability efforts since their 2017 pledge seem very lacklustre. It is one thing making a pledge and introducing more eco-friendly technologies, but if that doesn't meaningfully translate into the product portfolios of brands selling Gore-Tex clothes, then it feels disingenuous for these companies to promote sustainability as a core part of their brand identity as that can very easily mislead customers. The Gore-Tex website even has a sustainability section on its main navigation bar. This leads to a page that has a video on it called How Does the Gore-Tex Brand Unite Sustainability and Performance? which shows a lot of cool skiing clips and very little about their sustainable practices as a brand other than some very vague statements. On the Arcteryx website's sustainability section, they have this quote displayed very proudly. Our philosophy is guided by the belief that durability is the strongest path to sustainability. And yes, on a surface level, that would appear to be true as consumers are far less likely to throw away garments that are durable and last a lifetime. However, when the durability of your products relies on materials that need to be regularly recoated with PFA leaking DRWs to function for years of use, then I don't think that brand philosophy really holds up. Then, on the product lifecycle section of their website, they even state that short chain PFCs still exist in their DRW coatings, and although they are less damaging than the previously used longer chain ones, they are still bad for the environment. This statement was not followed by any sort of commitment to tackling this issue, so they seem to be fine with having environmentally damaging chemicals leaking from their products. Additionally, studies by the Food and Drug Administration in 2020 indicated that short chain PFCs were, quote, more toxic than previously thought. It's clear that we don't fully understand the effects of of these chemicals on both the environment and our bodies. It is also worth noting that when Gore Fabrics refers to hazardous PFCs slash PFAs, it is regarding only the ones that they have identified as being of environmental concern. Not that I'm trying to discredit Gore's research or question its validity, but I would be more comfortable as a consumer if an independent party decided what PFAs are deemed to be of environmental concern, especially as this is a subject where not everyone is on the same page. Taking a step back for a moment, it could seem like I'm singling out Gorpcore and bullying only outdoor clothing companies when realistically a large proportion of the fashion industry is probably just as guilty of similar practices, if not worse. 
The reason why I think this is a special case is that one of the main hooks of Gorpcore is that it's a way of outwardly expressing your appreciation for the great outdoors. The clothes are built to facilitate the enjoyment of nature, so naturally, the people wearing them are almost definitely advocates of environmentalism. Outdoor clothing, and by extension, Gorpcore is synonymous with sustainability. Why else would all these outdoor clothing labels make it such a large part of their brand identities? In the 2017 article that coined the term Gorpcore, there is even a whole section highlighting the inherent connection between the trend and environmental advocacy. As a result, this makes the sustainability narrative that is pushed by companies such as Gore and Arcteryx appear hypocritical and in some cases misleading to customers. You shouldn't have to do heavy research to find out that the £1,000 jacket you bought from a sustainability championing brand is actually leaking chemicals that are harmful for both the environment and potentially your body. Gorpcore was also propelled to new heights of popularity thanks to trend riding motherfuckers who only cared about the aesthetics. It is very unlikely they got an Arcteryx jacket because they care about the environment, but I guess that's pretty in line with their product consumption habits and their wardrobes for the fast fashion. However, with any fashion trend related to an activity, there will always be a pressure to adopt the lifestyle or risk being seen as a poser. Think about skate culture in the 2010s where it was considered illegal to wear a thrasher hoodie unless you could do a kickflip. People would pick up skateboarding as a result of being interested in the fashion side of it first. In most cases, I think this is a good way of getting into a hobby because even if you don't stick with it, you're at least supporting these niche brands that make clothes and products aimed at the community who partakes in whatever hobby. And before anyone accuses me of attempting to justify my past skate opposing transgressions, here are my credentials. Anyway, the same thing applies to Corpcore. The difference is, you need a fit pick on the side of a mountain to justify your wardrobe for the baggy nylon trousers and Gore-Tex jackets. If you're into fashion and have been on social media at all over the past few years, then I'm sure you've noticed the rise in previously city-bound people suddenly posting pictures from a field in the middle of nowhere. Yes, it's great more people are enjoying Mother Nature, but it has become very romanticized on platforms such as TikTok, and it is treated almost like an accessory to the clothing rather than the whole purpose. The number one rated hike in the UK. Let's see if it deserves that title. I don't know if you have ever wondered what happens on a Gort Girl hike. Uh, the release of harmful PFAs into those natural environments you're hiking through, apparently. I'm just joking. The aim of this video is definitely not to shame individuals like the people in these TikToks or any other consumers for buying Gore-Tex products. The morality of this issue is a bit more nuanced than, say, the people who are outwardly proud of their massive sweatshop made Sheehan hauls. Those people are c**t. I think it's obvious that the responsibility is on the companies producing the clothes rather than the consumers who, for the most part, aren't aware of these negative impacts. Some brands are better than others. For example, Patagonia's website makes it very clear which of their products are PFA-free and utilize the EPE Gore-Tex, which can't be said for all other outdoor clothing brands. This makes the process of a well-informed purchase decision for a consumer a lot easier. Ultimately, the point of this video is, outdoor clothing industry is making clothes for outdoors that are actually bad for outdoors, but consumers don't realize and buy clothes to help them enjoy outdoors and unknowingly contribute to the damage of the outdoors. That's the end of the video.